Hello, welcome. I'm Claudia Rizzini, the Executive Director of the Fellowship Program at Harvard University. I am excited to introduce today's fellows talk by Tizi Dangarenga. Tizi described herself as, among others, other things, an author, a filmmaker, a public intellectual, and a responsible citizen of Zimbabwe. Tizi's writing career spans four decades and includes plays, films, novels, short stories, and creative nonfiction. Her favorite project is always the one she's currently writing. Right now, it is a young adult dystopian speculative work set on a continent like Africa after the apocalypse. It is entitled Sai Sai and the Great Ancestor of Fire. Tizi has personally worked on over 20 films. In addition, as a founder of Nierai Films and multiple industry groups, she has been an influential supporter of Zimbabwean and African women filmmakers. In all her chosen uh, fields, she brings a talent for characterization and attention to detail, details and a perspective ear for dialogue to tell rich and compelling stories. One of her many great skills is capturing the ways history plays out in the lives of, its, of ordinary people who would otherwise be forgotten by the forces changing their worlds. Her project this year will bring that skill to tracing a history of the migration of the people known as Bantu through creative nonfiction. On a more personal level, at this point in time, Tizi is very grateful not to be languishing in a Zimbabwean jail. It is my pleasure to introduce this year's Joy Foundation Fellow, Tizi Dangarenga. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Claudia. Good afternoon, everyone in the room. It's lovely to see you all, even if it's making me a bit nervous. And greetings also to everyone who joined on Zoom. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. It is such an honor. But my appeal against my conviction and sentence has just been filed in Zimbabwe. So please forgive me if I am a bit scattered today. Um, I will be reading because I find that way I can actually say what I want to say. Um, so, the path of the people leads to the question, which people? And this is a catch-all for a large number of issues. To answer the question, which people am I talking about? I am going to start with three stories. This is the first story. The man in the front with the white t-shirt is called Job Sikala. As you can see, he is handcuffed. What the photo does not show is that he is also in leg irons. As member of parliament for the constituency Zengeza West, and by profession a lawyer, Sikala is a member of the Parliamentary Portfolio Committee on Justice, Legal and Parliamentary Affairs in the Parliament of Zimbabwe. Exiting the van behind Sikala is Godfrey Sitole. Sitole is the MP for Chitungwiza North. Chitungwiza is a dormitory city of Harare that the settler government built to house workers to supply labor to the capital, about 20 miles north. The smiling woman on the bottom right, yes, the bottom right, is More Blessing Ali. More Blessing lived in Nyatsime, an area that borders on Chitungwiza. She was a popular community organizer for the opposition party, Citizens Coalition for Change. 
On May 24 this year, more blessing was seen bundled away in broad daylight by two known male ZANU PF operatives, that is, operatives of the Zimbabwe African National Union Patriotic Front, the ruling party in Zimbabwe. A public outcry at More Blessings abduction caused the state to issue a statement claiming that one of More Blessings assailants was a former boyfriend of hers and so the matter was private and did not merit police investigation. Many Zimbabweans were incensed by this statement and the outcry intensified, especially when more blessing could not be reached by cell phone for several days. Sikala and Sitole pushed for and participated in investigation. On June 11, Ali's dismembered body was found in a well on property owned by one of the abductor's mothers. Unrest ensued in the Nyatsime area. Job Sikala, Godfrey Sitole, and 14 other residents who were members of the opposition were arrested and imprisoned without bail or trial. They are still in prison four months after arrest. The murderer, who was apprehended five days later, admitted to the murder. He said he had never had a relationship with more blessing, making a complete lie of the government's statement. This is the most recent story. It is ongoing. I suggested to a group I am loosely connected to that we start a petition. The petition raised over 53,000 signatures and hopefully will soon be delivered to the Zimbabwean government. This is to give you a sense of location. I'm sorry if I'm telling you information you already know. So this is a map of Zimbabwe with its neighboring countries all identified, as you can see. The northern border is marked by the Zambezi River, which is that blue mass at the top. The southern boundary is marked by the Limpopo River. It is drying up, so I have drawn it in in black. It's a bit shaky, I apologize, but I hope it gives the general idea the two rivers drain into the Indian Ocean to the east. Nyatsine, the area where the first story occurs, is marked by the red icon up in the northeast. The second story I'm going to tell takes place at the location marked with a red X, sort of towards the south, in Bulawayo. Zimbabwe's second largest city. The young man in the picture is the nephew of an investigative journalist called Nduduzi Matutu. The young man's name is Tawanda Muchehiwa. Matutu was one of the first journalists to break the news of massive state corruption related to COVID-19 resources that were coming in as aid to Zimbabwe during the height of the pandemic. State agents searched for Matutu, but could not find him. He'd gone underground. They then turned to Matutu's relatives, eventually abducting his nephew, Tawanda, at a shopping center in Bulawayo. The abductors, who I conceive of as terrorists, who, on the other hand, the state praises as patriots, 
drove Yang Tawanda into the bush where they interrogated him and tortured him. After the torture, he was found to have severe kidney damage. This kind of torture is a common tactic of some Zimbabwean state agents. They often beat their captives in such a way as to ensure severe kidney damage. The result is that the captive can die weeks or months later with no obvious evidence linking the death to the torture and beatings. With the third story, we are back in Harare. It is May of 2020. The three top left photographs show three female youth leaders of Zimbabwe's main opposition party. Their names are Joanna Mamombe, Cecilia Chimbiri, and Netsai Maroa. The photographs were taken when the women were found by citizens on a deserted road at night in a state of psychological distress and physical agony. The women said they had been abducted by state agents two days ago. They said they had been taken to a deserted area where they were mentally and physically tortured. I won't go into the details. The photograph on the top far right and the ones on the bottom left are of the young women in hospital after their rescue. When they reported their abduction and torture to the police, the result was the photograph on the bottom right. The Zimbabwean state charged them with faking an abduction and imprisoned them without bail before trial. The state went on to produce a video to prove its claim. I am a filmmaker and I have an opinion about that video. Zimbabweans who are not filmmakers also had a lot to say about it. This is where it gets tricky. Respected. We are majority. We are the people. We are the government. We are the army. We are the air force. We are the police. We are everything you can think of. We determine who can do mining in Zimbabwe. We determine who can construct the railway line in Zimbabwe. We determine who can build the road in Zimbabwe. No other party can do so. As a result of such events and such utterances, I found myself asking questions. What kind of people perpetrate such atrocities? Where did they come from? What is their etiology? Why do they behave in this way? I include the majority of the population in these questions you heard or the cheering and laughter. So I include the majority of the population also because there is a level at which we have acquiesced to the events that are unfolding in Zimbabwe. One of the Zimbabwean founding myths is that we came from a place called Guruswa, which means big grass. This implies we would have come from the north, where rain is more abundant than in Zimbabwe. My finding was that the story of Guruswa was both true and not true. The slide shows an area situated in today's eastern Nigeria and northwestern Cameroon along a river called the Benue River. 
I've outlined the area in black. The red arrows show different migration routes that migrants from this area took. The map indicates that the migration or expansion, as it is also called, began in the third millennium BCE. Other writers believe the movement began much earlier, as early as 7,500 BCE. The routes are directly down Africa's west coast, northeastwards through the Sudan, from there to East Africa, and then southwards and eastwards through Central Africa. The lands in Tanzania, east of Lake Tanganyika, have been said by some to be the mythical area of Guruswa, big grass. I've dotted the route of the migrants who eventually crossed the Zambezi River around 200 BCE. I've also, dotted, I've also dotted the continued movement that resulted in the migrants crossing the Limpopo River several centuries later. That is how the initially eastward and then southward wave of migrants from West Africa came to populate Zimbabwe. The migrants reached the central and northern parts of the East African coast, today's Tanzania, Kenya and southern Somalia between 1200 and 500 BCE. They soon saw ships arrive from Arab and Persian lands. They probably also encountered Arab caravans traveling overland. Pre-Islamic Arab peoples had settled in Ethiopia several centuries earlier um, in, the area, in the era before Christ. Arab and Persian settlement of the east coast of Africa continued over the centuries, eventually extending as far south as Mozambique. In the second half of the first millennium CE, independent city-states ruled by dynasties of Persian and Arab descent established for long-distance trading and, excuse me, established for long-distance trading cities along the East African coast. Integration of our migrants from West Africa with Arab and Persian traders led to a coastal Swahili culture. During their migration, the migrants from West Africa also encountered African people who were exotic to them. In some cases, the migrants made new settlements when they arrived in unpopulated areas. At other times, the migrants merged with the peoples they found en route. The migrants possessed iron weapons and tools, whereas the people they encountered fashioned theirs from stone. Clashes must have been inevitable. However, the migrants' progress appears not to have been bloodthirsty. I have not found an account of expropriating genocidal aggression. The purple circle is where the migrants who became the modern Zimbabweans ended their migration. They established a number of strong states. The earliest was Mapungubwe in the southwest. In fact, in the north of South Africa, but it is included in the culture of the group of migrants I am considering. Mapungubwe flourished between Christian era 1000 and 1300. A highly stratified society, it was also very wealthy, engaging in local as well as long distance trade since the Limpopo River linked it to the coast of the Indian Ocean. 
Great Zimbabwe, towards the center, thrive from the 13th to the 15th century. The Mwene Mutapa state, whose capital was in the northeast, was established in the early 15th century. Because of its size, civilization and strength, it is sometimes called the Monomotapa Empire. The southernmost of its large cities was at a place called Sofala, an important trading harbour city on the Indian Ocean that had been originally founded by the Arab people who had settled on the eastern coast. The southwest Torwa state was founded in the latter part of the 15th century with its capital at Kami, and the Roji state was established in the late 17th century close by. Some of these states coexisted temporarily in their different territories. The Mwene Mutapa state lingered on until the end of the 17th century. You can also see on the map smaller polities such as the Manika and the Teve in the east. I was going to tell you which of these polities I come from, but then I thought that might contribute to tribalism, which is an issue in my part of the world, so I won't tell you. The point is that the migrants did not see themselves as one people within one nation. At the end of the 15th century, the migrants from West Africa to Africa's east coast saw different ships on the ocean. These were Portuguese ships that had sailed south along the west coast of Africa from the early 15th century. At the end of the 15th century, Portuguese sailors succeeded in rounding the southern tip of Africa and proceeded to travel northwards along the eastern coast. The Portuguese established trade relations with the Mwene Mutapa state which was the most powerful state in the area at the time. At first, this international relationship worked well. In time, though, the Portuguese violated the terms of their treaty with the Mwene Mutapa state. The Mwene Mutapa, who was the leader, lost large portions of his eastern territories, including the coastline, and that is why Zimbabwe is a landlocked country until today. Around the middle of the 16th century, the migrants saw yet another kind of people, Northern Europeans, who also sailed down to the South African Cape and, beginning with the Dutch, established themselves in the western part of it. Much conflict followed, as listed on the slide. The migrants fought their first two frontier wars against the Dutch. Subsequently, the wars were against the British because, it is said, the Dutch went to war with France and asked the British to take over their colonies to avoid having them captured by the French. And there was a bit of back and forth after that that the British prevailed in 1795. For me, the Seventh Frontier War is significant, the one that I have in red. It is significant because it was the first time that Kosa women, the migrant people who had settled in the Western Cape, tortured, captured British soldiers, even unto death. My interpretation is that this shows a change in the ethical nature of the migrants. As well as physical migration, we now have what I currently call psychosocial or symbolic migration. The frontier wars ended with the British establishing administration 
over the Western and Eastern Cape and over Natal. The, this domination was followed in the latter part of the 19th century by the discovery of diamonds and gold. These discoveries brought people from the British Isles, as well as from the rest of what I call Anglo-Saxonia, and from other parts of Europe to the area to make their fortunes out of the territory that we now call South Africa. Apartheid laws meant that people from countries of pigmented human beings could not expect to do well there. Meanwhile, with the British controlling the coastal colonial settlements, the Dutch descended Afrikaners trekked northwards, northeast into the Transvaal. In fact, I'll just go back so that we can continue with the migrations. In the first half of the 19th century, a migrant general, Mzilikazi, fled from the now destabilized Natal area into the Transvaal. Their conflict with the Afrikaners, who had been pushed out of the Cape by the British, pushed Mzilikazi further north. This was the beginning of an exit of this group of migrants who had crossed the Limpopo centuries before back up north. So they came all the way down from West Africa, got to the southern tip of Africa. This destabilization happened, so they went back up north again. Some arms of this northern migration reached as far as Zambia and Tanzania where some of the languages spoken in these countries to this day are classified as dialects of Zulu, spoken in KwaZulu-Natal. These were definitely aggressive, bloodthirsty migrations. In fact, Mzilikazi came to found the Ndebele Nation in Zimbabwe. And the name Debele comes from a name they were given by people as they went northwards. They were called the Matabele, the people of the long shields, because they had these long cowhide shields. So this shows how warlike they were, because they were identified by um, their apparatus of war. So definitely aggressive, bloodthirsty. In my opinion, this strengthens my hypothesis that something fundamental had changed in the nature of the migrants over the course of the centuries and the millennia. Fleeing north, Zilikasi established his Ndebele kingdom in the western half of present-day Zimbabwe. In 1888, mining magnate Cecil Rhodes, who amalgamated the Kimberley diamond mines into De Beers consolidated mines in the same year, founded the British South Africa Company, BSAC, with Charles Rudd, his friend, and sent a party to deceive Lobengula, Zilikazi's son, who had ascended to the Amandebele throne in 1868 into signing the Rudd Concession. That was a treaty, basically. Falsely claiming that the Rudd Concession gave him mineral rights in all of Lobengula's lands Rhodes obtained a royal charter for his private company in 1889, so he was rewarded for his chicanery. The following year, 1890, Rhodes sent a pioneer column, which in reality was a private army of some 500 men, many of them vagabonds, into the migrant land 
northeast of Lobengula's jurisdiction, which the Europeans now called Mashona land. This they did to distinguish the area from Lobengula's that they called Matabele land. So they had also coined a name for all those different groups that I showed you in that slide with the purple circle in the middle. And now they were suddenly according to Rhodes and his people, the Shona people. From its new northeastern location, the British South Africa Company waged war with Lobengula's Amandebele people to the south and west in 1893. An uprising followed in 1896, in which many of the different migrant groups that had settled in the area, either directly from the north or returning from the south, turned against the British South Africa Company. They were savagely suppressed. The British South Africa Company's Royal Charter finally came to an end in 1915, when a civilian white settler government was installed. The white settlers had already begun to call the entire area between the Zambezi and the Limpopo rivers Rhodesia in 1895, after the first war with the Amandebele people. My project is to contribute to unraveling how the migrants who over millennia expanded for the most part peacefully from West Africa, turned into the sort of people who normalize the kinds of acts that I related in the beginning. I am setting out to map a psychosocial or symbolic migration as well as a physical migration. The migrant descended cultures exhibit until today many common elements that together have been called an Ubuntu philosophy of life, roughly translated a being human way of life. My hunch is that this being human way of life was organized and maintained by powerful social bonds that prescribed an individual's identity through socially acceptable ways in which the individual could interact with other people. So basically it was based on interactions with other people. So in this way, people could interact with others in order to satisfy their desires and live well together. My hunch that I will investigate while I am here is that colonization disrupted these bonds without providing an alternative structure of psychosocial bonding in which human desires could be satisfied positively. In Zimbabwe, this led to the arms struggle of 1966 to 1979 and the atrocities that have been endemic in the society ever since. The so-called liberating forces who had been forced into exile by the settler government became a state in exile, developed a culture in exile and returned with a sadistic guerrilla military culture that they impose and continue to impose on the people. Ubuntu was lost. I don't think it can be recovered. My intention is to write a book about what I have called a dual migration as outlined here. Migrant descended African philosophers and intellectuals are searching for new paradigms to stimulate a new way of positive bonding in migrant descended societies. I hope my work will contribute to that project. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.
you, Zizi. So um, the first question is, what evidence uh, it was do we have to reconstruct the early migration routes uh, during BCE? There is quite a lot of evidence. Um, I've read some of it. Uh, one just has to go. Uh, the band migration or expansion is, is something that is quite well known and uh, many historians are working on it. I personally prefer to call it a migration of people and I left out the word Bantu on purpose because it is a very loaded word. Um, it, it is a word that collapses millions of people into a single entity without any explanation of what it means. Um, in the original paper that I wrote in 2021, which was much longer and much more detailed, I did go into the explanation of Bantu. But for, for the purposes of this talk where I had a short time, I decided to stick to uh, the word migrant. I cannot really remember the sources because I'm not a historian. I'm looking for a story. But anybody who researches on the Bantu migration or the Bantu expansion will find a lot of material. Mm -hmm. How do the stories that you are excavating to get to your story uh, nuance or change the way we normally discuss questions of migration in mainstream media and politics. Well, I always remember Toni Morrison saying that her writing strategy was to put herself firmly in the centre and not budge. So this is what I try to do. Um, this is why I call the people migrants, because I can see myself as being one of the migrants, so um, one of my ancestors to whom I still have some cosmic relationship would have been one of those people who began. So it's really important for me to see ways in which I can situate myself in the situation. Uh, the stories uh, about Zimbabwe and other parts of Africa, Southern Africa in particular, which suffered five really big armed conflicts against, against uh, colonialism, really provide so many stories. And it's only a question of deciding which one one will tell at any particular time. Yeah. Do you have any idea of what kind of story you're going to tell? Uh, and what um, I, I am going to do a chronological story. Mm -hmm. And I am going to try to understand what I am calling at the moment the psychosocial and symbolic aspects of the people who are migrating. We, we are told about the rituals. They did this uh, and they did that. But rituals are simply expressions of something. And so this is why I finished with the idea of Ubuntu which people are now calling a, ph a philosophy that all of these cultures had in common and, and still claim to have, actually. People will still say, oh, we are Africans, we have Ubuntu, we don't do this, we don't do that. I think the reality has changed, but I think it is a useful framework for um, understanding the commonalities of those cultures. And how is this migration story related, related to the rhetoric of the governing party in Zimbabwe today, if at all? I really like that question, uh, and I'm so glad someone answered it. When we talk of Great Zimbabwe, that was the state that I mentioned that flourished uh, between 10,000, 13,000, maybe 1350 to 14,000 um, uh, Christian era. Mm -hmm. And Zimbabwe means great house of stone, and it refers to the culture of that time where people built with stone. 
and because there is a lot of granite, there is a lot of stone in Zimbabwe. And this culture was continued into some of the other states. For example, um, the, the state at Kami also has these kind of uh, stone structures. And in fact, they extend into Mozambique. Because remember, I said that the Menemtapa Empire also extended into Mozambique. So there are lots of these sites all over, all over the place. So Zimbabwe is a great house of stone, and it refers to uh, these buildings. And yet, the history that we are told, the patriotic history, is that Zimbabwe began in 1896 with the uprising that I mentioned. So I don't know whether people are aware of the elision that they have made or they just don't mind because they think that the majority of people won't think it through. Mm -hmm. But it is such an inconsistency. Um, but nobody seems to be very concerned about it, apart from me. Um, so the historical forces of colonialism that you describe affect many countries, but not all look like Zimbabwe today. Why is Zimbabwe in particular so different? Um, that is a very good question. Uh, I would need to know in which ways Zimbabwe is said to be different from other um, countries that have been colonized. I would need to know a little bit more, for example, um, who colonized? Was it the French? Was it the Spanish? Was it the Portuguese? Because obviously the different cultures of uh, the people who colonized would have an impact on the way the colonized people subsequently um, developed. Zimbabwe is, I think, a state that we look at with great disappointment because we had such great hope. Because the, there had been some infrastructure developed, not as much as people might want to say, but there had been enough infrastructure developed to be the building blocks for a successful state. So the question is, why then the failure? And this is what I am trying to, to tease out myself. And I do think that, first of all, the nature of um, colonization and the way it segregated people, because we had segregation, a kind of apartheid in Zimbabwe as well. It wasn't as severe as in South Africa, but it existed. And people were shunted into reserves, which were just um, uh, reservoirs of labor. So all of these arrangements do have a dehumanizing effect on people. And there, there was nothing offered that could reconstruct people's uh, psychosocial being into something meaningful. And I don't think that this happened only in Zimbabwe. Uh, Zimbabwe obtained its independence in 1980, and we are now in the 2020s, so it is a relatively young state. Having said that, though, I do believe that the guerrilla culture is part of the problem. And the allies that Zimbabwe had during the guerrilla war were, were the Eastern Bloc countries. And so my thinking is that um, a lot of that culture would have been reinforced by Eastern Bloc teachings. But then again, another part of history that I had to leave out was the way the British South Africa Company actually behaved. I mean, it's absolutely unspeakable. Uh, um, I have a book here, which will be out in um, January in the States, and I go into that a, a little, in a little bit more depth. Um, and so really, there, were, there was just such an explosion of negativity mm -hmm. that I am beginning to come around and to think the fact that we do have opposition parties the fact that we do have people like Job Sikala, who I showed you in, in one of those slides, is something very positive about Zimbabwe. So there is this huge issue, 
and I think people are right to question it, but I do think it's also important to understand uh, the particular nature of uh, the Zimbabwean history that we had, uh, especially with the settler Rhodesians declaring unilateral um, independence from the crown so that they could do basically what they wanted. Um, Zimbabwe is in fact a very unique country. They say it is the only country that started off as a private company, which was the British South Africa Chartered com uh, Company. And uh, the um, goals of a private company are to make profit by any means. So we have a country that started off in order to make profit. And I think that with that kind of founding value, a lot of recovery and repair is required. Um, could you expand more about the alternative philosophies you are exploring in your work about psychosocial connections in post-colonial world? I guess it follows up from what you just said. Yes, um, one that I think is could be very useful is the concept of ukama, which is being developed by a Zimbabwean who is in South Africa. Ukama literally means relationship. So you would say, I have ukama with my cousin. I, ha I have relationship with my cousin. But you can also use it in a more abstract way and call it relatedness. So Okama is talking about the relatedness of things. And I think that is basically, basically what I am doing in this research. I'm looking at how the different parts fit together in relationship into a whole. When I have seen that, then I can possibly make propositions about how what I see could be configured a little differently so that the relationships um, lead to us living in a better way together, which has always been the question of philosophy. How are we to live well together? And the next question is about, is about the format of the novel. So can you say why you want to tell this story as a young adult novel? Okay. I, uh, now I've been caught. Um, the young adult novel is the fiction I am writing. Okay, I thought there was some. Yes, there. but what the project I have here is the non fiction, the creative mm -hmm. non fiction. And yes, I will take a little bit of time now and again to work on the young adult novel while I'm here. Yeah, so it's just for clarity for whoever asked in the audience, it's two different projects. Two different projects, Got yes. It. Okay, can you tell me more about the uh, migrant descendant people from South Africa who fled back up north? Yes, um, that, that is a situation that has caused a lot of trauma in Zimbabwe. Because of this division that the colonial people instituted, they had this group of people that they called the Mashona, who were said to speak a certain language. And this was different from the Ndebele language that was spoken by the Amandebele, which belongs to the Nguni class of languages. So they really established a division between the two sorts of people. And one of the reasons to circumvent Matebele land and go up to the northeast mm -hmm. was said to be to participate in protecting the people from the Ndebele people because of course there was conflict. As I said, it, it was a very aggressive migration that followed. Um, and so that has become part of Zimbabwe's mythology. Mm -hmm. And the cultures had developed sufficiently differently for people not to see themselves as one, which is one point that I also made. Um, that 
developed into a situation during the armed struggle where there were two sets of movements that had political wings and also military wings. And the one set was primarily Debele and the other set was primarily Shona, not completely, but primarily. And because uh, the people who are called the Shona, it, it, it's a term I dispute, but I have to use it because that's what we have. So the people who are called the Shona are the majority. And so at independence, their party won. And there followed a genocide of Ndebele people in Zimbabwe. It went on from about 1983 until 1987. And that has still been unresolved. And so it is one of the issues that, that we really need to resolve as a nation if we are going to um, progress in any positive way. And at the moment, I, I do not really see that uh, the state is taking appropriate steps for resolution. Um, there is a question about the Pioneer Column. Could you tell us more about the Pioneer Column? In fact, what was the Pioneer Column? So expand on that um, okay. concept. So Cecil Rhodes had this idea of establishing a British corridor in Africa from Cape to Cairo. And he already controlled the Cape. He became prime minister of the Cape Colony at one point. And as a mining magnate, he was very powerful all throughout South Africa. Um, there was a belief that uh, Zimbabwe was the land of Ophir and that there was abundant gold and minerals and wealth to be obtained there. And so Cecil Rhodes was eager to begin his Cape to Cairo project by also annexing uh, what is now Zimbabwe. And to do so, he, he actually got together a private army. He had a private company, and this private company employed a private army. So now, when the gold and diamond rush had begun in South Africa in the middle of the 19th century, as I said, people came from everywhere. And it was different kinds of people. For example, there, there were very many people from Cornwall because of the tin mines in Cornwall. So we had a lot of artisan people from Cornwall. Um, and so they, they were not magnets like some of the Americans who came in who had made their money in the, in the silver mines in Idaho or other people who had been in the gold mines in Australia and that kind of thing. So we had a different tiers of uh, classes that came. And so th there would have been a lot of people who really did not make it and needed any chance that they could. And these were all white people. Um, if they had black people, they were just as servants. So these were the people that he got together uh, and armed with guns and other kinds of weapons and called the Pioneer Column. And the express purpose was to go and um, annex Mashona land for the British crown, which they actually did. Uh, and they planted the, the British flag at uh, Harare in 1890. The next question is, has Ubuntu been truly lost or could it be used as, a ho as hope for the present and the future? I think Ubuntu as practice has been lost. I think Ubuntu as idea, as possibility, as potential is still with us. I think it can form these other paradigms that many philosophers uh, proposing and debating um, into something that can be useful. But Ubuntu was tied to a certain socio-economic structure. And that socio-economic structure has changed. 
and so Ubuntu cannot actually function. In fact, in South Africa, there's a debate now about something called black tax. Black tax is the money that people who are well off and earning have to pay or give, donate to members of their family, maybe the nuclear family or even the extended family who do not have these opportunities. So this is another side of Ubuntu. Ubuntu requires that you pay, but in the present kind of economy that we have, it may not be possible. So, so we need to rethink Ubuntu into something that is, let's call it Ubuntu 201 or something like that. Now, this is uh, a million dollar question, I guess, uh, and a very complex one. But if you have a, an immediate thought, do you see any similarities and differences in how colonial violence changed Zimbabwe's culture and colonial violence's impact in the US? So the comparison between the US and Zimbabwe? I really do not know that much about the US because this is the longest time I've been here, actually, uh, these nine months that I will be here for this residence. I've been in and out. So I really cannot say that I know very much. Um, I think that generally the uh, Anglo-Saxon occupation of the US was more overtly genocidal. Um, I think the economic relations had changed by the time colonization began in my part of Africa, so that uh, uh, that overt genocide was seen to be no longer necessary on the one hand. And as you saw with those frontier wars, uh, uh, the people put up such great fights to the extent that the women actually came into the fights. Um, and so I think it was a, a totally different uh, situation. I would say that there are similarities, and I would say that the intentions of expropriation and appropriation were similar. I think that one of the areas that is very interesting for me is what do we make of the relationship of those, of what I call pigmented people who were transported across um, the ocean. And I like to point out that if something was taken away and put in another place, terrible things happened in that other place, but it also meant that there was a deficit in, in the place uh, where these people were taken away from. And again, I talk about this in my book, um, Black and Female. So I think there are parallels, but I think that the parallels are not sufficiently similar yeah. for us to be able to say that they are one-to-one. -one. But I think we can learn from each other mm -hmm. by looking at our different experiences. Thank you, Tzizi. Thank you for your talk and for your perspectives. I also want to thank the audience for their terrific questions. I hope you'll be able to join us for other Radcliffe programs. You can find out about future programs and watch videos of past events at radcliffe.harvard.edu. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you so much.